And um, I said, you know, quite honestly, I said, I didn't realize you guys knew I was an expert on funnels. All right, and uh, it, it's kind of surprising that you don't really realize what kind of reputation you have out there. But the truth is, I kind of have got a little bit of a reputation for funnels out there. So they said, well, now, you know, we'd like to know, can you bring some unique funnels that you may have used? And I said, hell yes, I've got some unique funnels that I can use. I said, I've got a double funnel. I said, we can be a hands-on experience. This is going to be the greatest conference ever. <laughs> can you imagine my disappointment when I found out what they were talking about was sales funnel that drives sales, using technology to leverage email and other sources of leads. So I don't want you to get discouraged because what we're going to do here, we're going to go through this. I've got some three examples of sales funnels. We're really going to get down at that granular level. We're going to talk about a lot of different tools that I use in my uh, sales funnels. We're going to talk a little bit about the strategy that we employ with sales funnels. But then uh, we'll have a little question and answer period at the end. But I think we're still going to have time if we need to break this out. So, so don't give up on me on that tip, all right? It's here. It's going to be, it's going to be available for at whatever time that cocktail hour shows up. So let's start talking about sales funnels and how we can use them in golf to make more money, increase our sales. We're going to start out by saying, what is a sales funnel? You know, the one thing that I love about the eggheads that are out in Silicon Valley, you got to give them credit. They're not only smart, they're not only come up with a lot of stuff, they have some great names for stuff. You know, a sales funnel, I don't know whoever first thought about this, but whoever designed the term sales funnel came up with something that is exactly accurate for what we try to do in marketing. Okay, and to understand that, let's look at a traditional funnel. This is a traditional funnel right here. Um, and funnels have a number of things in common. They have an area that collects from kind of a wide area. You can take a couple of quarts of oil, you can take gas, you can take a couple cans of other liquid and pour in this funnel, and it collects them in this wide area right here. It concentrates that down into a single stream. It's kind of like a collector in that, in that regard. And then it delivers that to a specific source through a constricted pipeline, okay? And notice it's important, you got this constriction going on right here. Now, some of those pipelines are long, okay? Some of them might be short like this right here, and that's very true for what happens in sales funnels. Sometimes, and particularly in B2B, sales funnels can uh, have a pipeline that's very long. You know, the time from initial contact until the sale can actually be years. In golf, we tend to have a much shorter pipeline, and so the sale generally takes, and quickly, takes place in a much quicker time frame. So let's look at a typical sales funnel and how that might compare to a normal traditional funnel. First of all, we've got multiple ways of bringing uh, leads in to the mouth of the sales funnel, that big wide open thing. So it will funnel everything through. And what we're going to talk about today are all these others. We're going to have a little bit of a focus on emails. I'm going to give you some tips on emails. We're going to look at how you can use emails to increase the sell through and your, your profitability from your sales funnels. Then we're going to look at the pipeline. You know, how do you actually take that, drive that to a single source of collection, and then deliver those leads to those prospects and make happy, committed golfers out of them at your golf course? All right, now when I'm talking about this, I'm going to give you a lot of details. I'm going to give you a lot of different tools that I use, but there's something that's really important that you know. First and foremost is there are just limitless number of tools that you can use to accomplish these same things. So don't get hung up on exactly what I do. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, I'm going to show you some different types of funnels that we use, that we've designed. They all use different types of tools to kind of give you a broad brush stroke of how we do that. But uh, think in terms of what you might already have available to you. For example, emails. A lot of you may be using a particular email program. Virtually any type of email communication can be part of this strategy. Uh, some of them are geared towards a little bit better than others, but just about any can be adapted to using that. And so I'm going to be telling you some of the ones that I use, but that doesn't mean that that's the only one that you can use. You can certainly use others. So let's look at the different types of funnels that we might have out there. You're going to think kind of, uh, you, you really have to think in a broad measure on this. Funnels can be very targeted in terms of marketing. It can be a very small funnel. For example, this one right here could be one where my target market are mothers of children ages 6 to 10 within 15 miles of my golf course. That's a pretty well-defined marketing segment or persona that we're going after right there. Our end result of this particular sales funnel might be I want to get 10 to 12 junior golfers to attend my Saturday junior beginner clinic. Okay, we can design a sales funnel that specific to achieve this goal, and you can have a great deal of success with that. <clears throat> now, I'll tell you another one, and this is one that I like to term <clears throat> a broader sales funnel. Okay, it's a bigger sales funnel. This sales funnel 
can actually be targeted at anybody that is breathing who, for God's sake, will come to my golf course and spend money with me. Okay? Now, that's one that a lot of us use a lot. Now, I'm going to tell you, the bad thing about this is this type of sales funding is, prop funnel is probably your least effective. It's probably your lowest return on investment. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have one. I've got several that are out there. And uh, these can actually bring you business, but these are usually not the ones that will really deliver in terms of impressive performance. And this really is, if you think about it, you know, almost any marketing effort that you do in some way or another is a sales funnel. It might not be, the, it might not be designed well as a sales funnel. But ultimately, it's trying to do the same thing we're trying to do with a sales funnel, which is end up bringing golfers to our golf course. So, one of the first things that we do when we design a sales funnel is we have a worksheet. So, if everybody's got internet access here, I wanted to give you an opportunity to get a copy of the worksheet that we use. This info.mailratcliffe.com. If you just go to that, a little quick thing you can fill out on there, it will email you the form. We're going to email it to you in two different types. All right? One of them is going to be a PDF that you can actually print out, and it will, um, you know, it's, it's, it's designed for you to print out and fill out by hand. The other one is an editable PDF that you can actually fill out online or on your computer, even on your cell phone, and then you can save that or you can print it out. So if you want, if you're thinking if you have some ideas or something, you have to download this form while you're in here. I want you to be able to have this sales funnel worksheet so that you can be filling these things out actively as we go. Now I'll tell you, I'll talk to you about, I mentioned tools. There are a lot of tools that I think anymore are almost essential in business. And one of my favorite tools, one that I'm going to refer to a lot here, is almost any type of tablet. Your tablet is an awesome piece of information technology, okay? If you don't do anything else, if you go to YouTube, you can learn how to do virtually anything. There is somebody that has made a video on YouTube that will show you how to do something. I have a uh, part on my dishwasher at my house that broke down. It's a little thing that holds the soap in. So when you close it, it latches, you know? The latch on it broke. I went to YouTube and somebody had made a video on how to replace that little part on the particular dishwasher that I had. Now the service technician I called was going to have somebody come out and fix it. $230 something dollars is what they're going to charge when you come to fix it. I ordered the car online, it cost me $32, I fixed it in less than five minutes myself through this video. So a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, I'm going to go into depth on, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. And the reason for that is you do have the ability to learn how to use some of these tools. If you don't, <coughs> if you don't really understand how to do this, there are a lot of online resources that you can go to. I spend a lot of time sometimes, I love to read, you know, so I'll download a Kindle book. But I also spend a lot of time watching how-to videos on my iPad before I go to sleep at night. Just sitting there watching, you know, so many fascinating things on there. So, great tool of information. So, if everyone has that going to, if you've gone to the website there and downloaded that form, this is what it looks like. It's just a very simple one-page document. And really, all this is is just an organizational tool. This is something for you to get your thought processes going before you begin the actual process of building a sales funnel or any kind of a marketing effort. It goes through virtually basically five different steps that we're going to talk about in order to design a sales funnel. Now you have to realize these are steps that you would go through in almost any marketing effort that you do. You know, we call it a sales funnel, but virtually any type of marketing that you do, you're going to go through these five basic steps. You will find different um, books, you'll find different uh, marketing gurus that have different um, actual steps that they take. They may they do these in a different order than what we do, but I'll explain to you the order as we go through it and why I like to do it in the order that I've got. Step number one for me is the objective. What is your desired outcome? I like to start out by defining where do I want to end up. Okay, what do I want to happen from this very moment? Then step number two is a target market. Who am I trying to reach? You know, if you think about it, those are two really important questions. If you're going to be really you know, if you're, if you're really trying to get the maximum efficiency out of your marketing dollars, you need to answer these two questions first and foremost. What do I want to achieve, and who am I going to achieve it with? Then the third thing is conversion. We have to know, how are we going to make that transaction happen? Now, in the past, I'll tell you what, and I've, I've been guilty of this myself, uh, you know, a lot of our efforts are really, conversion is, okay, we want to get them to come to the golf course. We want to come to the golf course and spend money, right? Well, there are other ways to achieve conversion. One thing that technology has given us is the ability to handle transactions 
do an automated way online before somebody ever gets to our golf course. So most of the sales funnels that I show you today are going to be focused on some type of conversion that happens online. So if we're going to make that conversion happen online, we next have to figure out collection. How are these leads collected? Where do we drive these people to in our marketing efforts? Where do we want them to go in order to get them to convert to whatever transaction we're trying to achieve up to step number one? And then finally, the fifth step is awareness. And awareness is how do I reach my market? Advertising, marketing, what are we doing to make sure that we drive our target market, that we, that we drive in step number two to the collection so that we can convert them to the objective? Okay, does everybody get that? It's kind of a little bit convoluted there, but this step, this process, if you go through this form and you fill this out in this process, I can guarantee you by the time you get through, you'll have a very good understanding of what it is that you want to achieve. Okay, so let's look at some examples right here. This one is one of my favorite ones simply because I love the concept of this. And I can tell you, if you are not running a craft beer golf tournament in your facility, if you're not doing this, if you want to pay for the expense of this conference, for your travel here, and maybe even cover a few dollars that you might have lost on the gambling tables, to run a craft beer golf tournament. Okay? This is a no-brainer. Beer and golf go together like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> All right, we actually have it as a mission statement of our company to educate beer drinkers to that fact. You know, we're trying to convert these beer drinkers to golfers, they just don't know it yet. The can open is one something we started. We thought, well, this is a really great thing. You know, can uh, craft beer is just, just going over the top. You know, everywhere you got, we've got over 50 uh, breweries now, craft breweries in Charlotte. So it's really a no brand. You can only have people that like to drink beer, you got plenty of sponsors out there that want to reach the same market that we're trying to reach. Trust me, if you have a craft beer tournament, you will find sponsors for your tournament in your local breweries. So there's a couple of things. Whenever we do any kind of an event or any kind of a marketing effort, I like to brand that um, uh, event, okay? And so we go through this whole process of uh, designing this uh, the worksheet steps with the idea we're going to brand this craft beer golf tournament to something that we want to continue to do. This is an annual event for us now. We're doing it on a regular basis every year. Okay, so our objective for this particular event and this particular sales funnel is drive online sign-ups for a craft beer golf tournament. Now notice one important thing right here is I put the term online sign-ups in here. We are very customer service oriented. But if there is any way I can keep our frontline staff from having to answer the phone and explain the details of golf tournament, how to sign up, take registrations over the phone, I want to drive the market away from that. So we want them to do this online if we possibly can. I'm a huge believer in automation. The more things that we can automate, the better we are. Our target market, pretty big. Um, I've got previous participants in this tournament. Uh, we've got our database, which is the Rapid Golf Services database. Let me go back to the huge there. Golfers within 25 miles of Renaissance Park Golf Course. Now, this is the golf course that we host this event at. And we also want people that like to drink beer, okay? So that's pretty much our market. Now, that's a pretty broad market, but it's actually something we can use all of these elements to really design our marketing and our outreach program to drive these people into our sales funnel. Our conversion and collection method for this is a tool that we use called the Golf Digest Planner. And again, remember I told you, I'm going to give you some specifics on stuff. This is not the only tool out here. There are a number of event planners out there. You may be using something different. You may be using something that's embedded within your, your T-sheet point of sale system. Um, there's a lot of things. Even uh, Constant Contact has some event uh, uh, features in it that you can use. So there's, there's a lot of ways you can do this. We just happen to use this when we started using it. It's a good tool for us, it works really well, uh, and it's not, uh, it is certainly an affordable one. And so our awareness and advertising campaign for this starts out with email. We're gonna talk about email. We're gonna talk about how segmentation of your email and targeting that email, and I'm gonna show you some real results that were really, it surprised me. We can show you what the value of segmenting your email is can be. We use Facebook for this. This particular event is one of our outreach events. We're trying to bring new golfers in. We're trying to bring people that have never played at our facility before. So we also are trying to use this in an event as a way to lure them in, to get them into our network, to capture their data, 
so that can, we can then begin marketing to them as regular customers of our golf course. We also have on-course signage. Now I can tell you, the great thing about these three combined right here is this is a very economical marketing plan for this golf course. I'm going to show you what our cost is on this for the event we ran this year in spring. Okay, here's a shot of the Golf Digest Planner website. Uh, it's actually a really good tool that we use. We actually encourage some of our tournaments that are hosted our golf courses to use this. We drive them to this event or to, to this website for their event. It has a lot of tools on it that allow you to run a golf tournament very efficiently. And it's pretty affordable. We pay for the golf, the, crack, the crack open, we pay 97 bucks per event to host it on here. And for that, we get a lot of things. You get this dashboard right here. The dashboard will give you uh, a lot of tools that you can use to manage your event efficiently. One of the real important ones is right here, this event website. The, the, this site actually hosts a website for you. It's a templated website. You basically just enter the information in, put a few pictures on there, and boom, you've got a website that's ready to go that you can start driving people to. So this is our collection tool, okay? This is also our conversion tool. A lot of places that offer some of these services don't also allow you to convert the people that come to your collection, but this one does. This has a means that if you click down on this, uh, this book, let me go back here. Right here are the players. You can set up your different fees. You can have uh, single player fees. You can get a discount for groups of four. You can do a early entry discount. You can do a late entry uh, penalty. There's a lot of things that you can do with that. Uh, it, it organizes your players. Uh, you actually have an email marketing component that's in embedded in this. We don't use that, but you can if you want. Um, we have uh, your sponsors. You can set up sponsor levels, and you can actually have the sponsor sign up and, 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 and pay for a sponsorship right online, right on the website here. So it's a great tool to use. I don't want to do all that stuff, but I wanted to show you how simple it was to set up a website. I don't know what I did here. Lost. I got happy on my button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just. Yeah. There we go. Let's see if this thing works. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is the uh, this is how you set up your website. It's really a pretty uh, one-page thing where you just go through. You put your event details in uh, right here. We call this. This is one we just ran uh, back in the spring of this year. It's called the Can Open Spring Edition 2017. You put your text in right here. This is a kind of a standard text editor for our websites. If you're, you're used to using uh, different ways of putting on templated websites. You can embed pictures and everything. You can enter in the number of players that you're expecting to have. You choose a picture. This is the picture that we got right here from a previous event. And then you've got the logo. You can update your logo, load it on right there. And then this is a screenshot of the website that it produces from just that information. That's all I did was fill that out. It took me about maybe 10, 15 minutes to fill it out and then this website pops up. I left that website up. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you want to go on view it. It's, it's still up right now. You can't register for the tournament. It's already those that all want to play. We can't, we're no longer taking uh, a registration for it. It closed to so play on view in a second. But the reality is, you know, this is our collection thing. And I'm going to give you a couple more tips for collection. I mentioned I'm a big proponent of branding. I think the more that we can pay in terms of attention to details in our marketing, the better that speaks to the services that we're able to um, to deliver at the golf course. People are inundated with marketing messages anymore. We're constantly being bombarded by marketing. So you really need to make sure that the marketing that you have out there is stepped up to at least the level that captures the attention of the, get the customer that you've got. Now, a lot of you may not have access to graphics departments. We certainly don't. But if you look at this, this logo is a logo we developed for the open, and it's a very simple logo. It's very easy to do. It's comprised of three different clip art pieces. That little golf ball on a tee, the cans of beer, this little banner that we were able to put a craft beer golf event like that, and then just the letters that can open. So those three little things and some text, we created a logo that's unique and distinctive to this event. Okay? And this is what we put on everything that's associated with the can open. Now another thing that I am a big believer in is if you can, if you can secure a URL, if you can secure a website address that is unique to people to remember, it's always a good thing to do it. 
I use GoDaddy. GoDaddy is one of my favorite things. I like them before they had them after. I like them after. They do a lot of great things. I've probably got close to 70 or 80 websites that I maintain on there. I actually have craftbeergolf.com. That's a pretty good website for a golf tournament, isn't it? So we have craftbeergolf.com. It costs me $8.95 a year to buy that URL on GoDaddy. Okay? So we spend $8.95 a year. We bought that, I think we bought that for like five years. We're probably going to keep it. The great thing about this is, is once you have something like that, that website that we saw, and I'll go back over right here, the can open. Now you can see this is what the URL is that they send you to when you do this templated website. You can see how that extends it. There's no way I would be able to go out and market that to people unless it was embedded somehow where they could just click on it. But we can tell people, go to craftbeergolf.com. Okay, you go to craftbeergolf.com and it takes you to this website. As a matter of fact, y'all like to try that right now. Anybody wants to try it, you should be able to type in craftbeergolf.com and it'll take you to this website. Okay, so the other thing that we do, and coming back to our whole awareness and our advertising, we take a very structured approach to how we advertise and market this one event. And I'll tell you what the hierarchy is. First and foremost, we email out to prior participants. Because they support us in the past, we give them kind of a heads up. You get first dibs, you're the first opportunities to come into this. The way that we do that is through email. Cheapest, easiest, and most effective way to reach your customers, particularly if they've done business with you before. We actually, for this campaign, we use MailChimp. I've got a number of email services that I use. I don't know why I use so many different things, but it's, it's a good thing because when I'm asked to do these presentations on sales phones, I can talk about all different kinds of stuff that we use. Okay? So MailChimp is the one we use for this particular thing. Now I want to talk a little bit about targeted emails and why it's important to segment your database. Okay? In our normal database, we have 19,000, see right there, I've got 19,000 active emails on the pile. By the way, we are, we, we are absolutely dedicated. We keep this current all the time. We're always updating this for this. We're always importing. We're always, if we have uh, hard bounces, we delete those bounces out. We put a lot of effort into that. In the prior participants, we only had 112 recipients. Now, Keep in mind, when you see how we set this tournament up, this tournament, we actually now sell it by foursomes. We don't even try to sell it by individuals. We sell it by foursomes, okay? So 112 is probably closer to about 400 people that played in the tournament previously. Look at the difference in the open rates. To my regular, and this is the exact same email, okay? The regular database that we go to, this 19,000, we only had 14.4% open. We had 37.6% open on the previous listing. And look at the click-through rate, 7.3% on the click-through rate. So that's a pretty substantial click-through rate that you have. Just shows the power of how if your email is relevant to whatever it is that you're trying to market to, people are going to open that email. Just naturally, okay? If it's not relevant to it, and there's a lot of ways that an email in a blast <coughs> circumstance can not be relevant. It could be we're emailing somebody that doesn't drink beer. You know, if it is, they're not going to be interested in opening that email. Now, it didn't cost us anything to send that email to them. But we're taking a chance. They may be making a decision. You know what? I'm tired of sending emails from Rackford Golf. I'm going to opt out of their mailing list. So anytime we can, we actually, this is the second, by the way, something didn't mention. This is the second email that we sent to them. We sent an email out to them first that basically says, hey, we're opening up registration. Go to the website and register. And then when we do the second email, we email it out to the overall database, and then we email it out to this. For this particular event, I'm going to do three emails. We only do three emails for the can open. All right, we do one to the previous participants, we do one to our overall database, and then we do a second one to the previous participants. Then from there, we start marketing outside of our current existing customer base. Because I'm going to use this event to pull new media. Now we're trying to get fresh media. We're trying to get people that have not played with us before. So how do we do that in a cost-effective manner? We go to Facebook. Facebook and social media can be a great tool to use to market effectively for a very economical rate. Okay, now remember, going back to what we had said in terms of our criteria, we have a lot of information on who our target market is. So I could go to Facebook. Now, a couple things still I'm going to talk about on this right here. I don't know how many of you, how many of you actually use Facebook? Okay, that's great. Everybody, that's awesome. That's great. How many of you use the uh, Power Editor? What, sorry? Power Editor. How about Ads Manager? Okay, Ads Manager and Power Editor are very similar tools. Power Editor is supposed to be a little more sophisticated than the Ads Manager. Um, a lot of people in Facebook advertising don't even realize those tools are available. 
Facebook has got an immense library of tools that are available for you to be able to market to their consumers, okay? And uh, ads manager, these are actually shots here from an ads manager. I'm gonna go through this and I'll give some details on it. But basically, when you're doing Ken, you're doing Facebook advertising. Now, I'm not talking about boosting posts. We don't ever boost posts. We, you do set a little thing up there that says this boost, this post has been seen by X number of people, click here, boost this post, or whatever, we don't do that. This allows you a lot more, you can really design and customize the marketing campaigns you do on Facebook by using the ads manager or using Power Editor in Facebook, okay? When you go and you set up a campaign in Facebook, there's actually three levels that you're looking at setting up in Facebook. The level number one is the campaign. That's the overall, kind of we call that the bucket that all of this stuff is going to fall into. And for this one right here, our campaign is the Charlotte Can Open. Okay? Then right underneath the campaign within Facebook is what's called an ad set. All right? An ad set is what really defines who does this marketing go to and how long does it last. Okay? So within an ad set, you're able to set a lot of criteria that says who is going to get to see the ads that we're paying Facebook to deliver. All right? So I'm going to go through what the criteria was here. Our name on this one was the Charlotte Can Open. Uh, 21 plus, very important. If you're doing something that's related to alcohol, you need to make sure that your age ranges are over 21. Facebook will kick it back to you. Trust me, I know I've made a mistake of not putting that 21 in there. Okay. So you also choose where you want to drive your traffic. Now remember, we've already created our funnel. We've already created a collection point at the Golf Digest Planner. So we're driving these all to the Craft Beer Golf website. The next thing you set in your ad set, if you're using the ads manager, is your daily budget. It can be anything from just, you know, a dollar or two a day all the way up to however much you want to spend. Facebook will automatically enter your pricing in on this. And there's a lot of things that you can do to even customize how you spend this money. Now, what we did, if you look, this was a five-day campaign. Okay, see there? May the 2nd to May the 7th. So that just ran for those five days. So that's going to be important here in a few minutes. The other thing that's really interesting about when you do Facebook, Depending on the criteria you pick, and we're going to show you that here in just a minute, it constantly updates and shows you what your potential reach is. Right now, the criteria that I set on this right here, my potential reach was 290,000 people, okay? And then based on the amount of money that I set for my daily budget, it will tell me how much in a day I can expect. I can expect a range of somewhere between 860 and 3,300 people a day will see that ad pop up in their Facebook feed, okay? Of those, I can expect that somewhere between 10 and 65 will actually click through to my website. All right, and that's what I'm paying them on. I'm paying them on, a, this is a pay-per-click marketing effort, okay? So every time someone clicks on there, I pay it. If they don't click, the great news is, this 860 to 3,300 people a day, I don't pay for that. That's just, a, that's just a bonus you get. That's just exposure you get. We only pay whenever we get link clicks. Now you can, you can set up campaigns to go just on impressions, all right? There are other ways that you do that. For a sales funnel, you almost always want to have some kind of direct action step. You know, we're trying to get them to take a specific action, and so we want to pay just when they take the action that we're wanting to do. Okay, here's where it gets fun. What we do on our ad criteria, now we, we set how much money we're going to spend. Now we're going to tell who we want to spend this money on. We're going to spend it on people that live uh, within 25 miles of Charlotte, North Carolina, between the ages of 21 and 65 plus. This right here is an important number. That falls to 18, okay? If you're doing something pushing beer or liquor or alcohol or anything like that, you've got to set that one right there at 21. You can actually pick the gender that you want. You can pick the languages that you speak. So we're doing all genders. We're doing anything. They don't even have to talk, okay? <laughs> all right, add criteria. We're still defining what that market is, and this is where it really becomes powerful. Okay, because not only does Facebook know whether they're male or female, where they're accessing Facebook at, um, you know, their ages, they also know what their interests are. Facebook tracks this information and it allows us as advertisers to target based on that information. So we have two criteria that we really look at, that is golf and beer. Now under beer, we actually pick craft beer and also do craft beer and brewing. Those of you that know me know this, but some of you do not know me. I also have a distillery, we have a winery, and we have a brewery. And we teach people how to make beer. So a lot of the beer making are people that I want to kind of get into my marketing. If I can capture them even on the golf side, they're eventually going to hear from me on the brewing side, so I can 
you know, I could sell them beer, I could sell them liquor, I could sell them golf. Hopefully, I'm going to find something to sell them. Okay, so once we set all this ad criteria, now we basically got the shell that defines who we're going to, who's going to see these ads. Who's going to see these ads on Facebook that we do? All right, in this, you come into the ad design panel. And again, there's three separate levels within Facebook. You've got your campaign, your ad sets, and then your actual ad design. The ad design is actually pretty easy. If you ever look at the Facebook paid ads that show up in your feed on Facebook, they're all very similar, okay? And so all you have to do is just know what are you going to put into each one of those areas that Facebook has already designed for their ad. So I'm going to show you what we do for this particular one. First and foremost, we you have to tie it into an existing Facebook page. Okay, that is one criteria that you have to do. So each one of my golf courses, a little bit different strategy on, on Facebook advertising than I have on uh, website advertising. We actually have a, what I call, it, it, in true, it's an aggregator site that we market all five of our golf courses and one is called charlottepublicgolf.com. We don't have individual website pages for the golf courses. I like the aggregator site where we're marketing strength of numbers, right? So for Facebook, it's a totally different thing. Each one of our golf courses has an individual Facebook page. So Renaissance Park has its own Facebook page. Then after that, we get to come down and we get to say, okay, what is going to be the main center portion of this ad? Now, what we're talking about right here is this portion right here. Now, you can use an existing post. And I'm going to tell you, if you've designed that post to be a collector ad, or if you've got the, the, the information in that and it's presented in a way that's going to drive people to your collection spot, there's nothing wrong with using an existing post. But there's also a lot of strength in using a custom designed ad. Now, I'll tell you another thing, too. Facebook gives you a number of ways that you can show your ad. All right, and, and they're always changing. You always look at this right here. So one thing about it, I'll tell you, we actually created a software platform that uh, totally different scenario. And we were designing this thing because I wanted to automate the interface between my point of sale and Facebook. Okay, Facebook changes their platform so much we couldn't keep up with it. The minute we got something that would work, the very next day it wouldn't work anymore because Facebook changed it. They change stuff all the time. So you can watch out for this. But one of the main things you want to do is Facebook advertising. If you're going to use this one right here, that's the one that we use 99% of the time, an ad with an image or video, okay? Uh, it gives you the option on which one of those that you want to do. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is something I'm not sure if this thing is going to work. I don't always have good uh, results with video in a PowerPoint presentation. If you can, always, 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 always use an animated or a, an animated GIF, a GIF, or a video in your Facebook marketing. Okay? I'm going to explain to you why. Let me see first and foremost if I get this. Oh, no. I want to see if I get to play on the computer. Because I want you to see this. Yeah, here's going to play. Alright, it's playing right now. Okay, very simple visual message. That one actually has audio that goes with it, but because of the way the computer's set up here, I can't get the audio plugged all this is just music, okay? The idea is, anytime you have animation playing, it draws the eye. Our eyes are naturally drawn to motion, okay? As a matter of fact, you ever, you ever look into what they teach you in camouflage, one of the first things is be still, don't move, okay? Our eyes aren't drawn to a static image. So in a typical Facebook ad, and I'm gonna go back here, okay? I don't have a, the whole ad, but I'm going to show you something about it. The image, this portion right here, is the first thing that the majority of people look at when they see a Facebook ad. The next thing is right below this, right down in here, there's a headline, and then they go up and they start reading this. That's a natural progression that Facebook's determined over 80% of the people follow every time they see an ad. Okay, so they see the image, they read the headline, and then they start reading your text. Okay? By the time they're reading your text, your image has already made whatever impression it's going to make on them. All right? Another thing that's really interesting about Facebook is if you use a static image, if you just use a JPEG or a PNG or something like that, and it's static, they limit the amount of text or words you can actually have on that image. You can actually get turned down on Facebook for an ad if your logo is on there and the text portion of your logo is too big. Okay, actually, most of my logos won't work. If I were to just use that logo right there and try to use that as a static image on Facebook, it will not show that ad because they do not want to see text on pictures. Okay, 
However, I can put that onto a GIF. Is everybody familiar with what a GIF is? You know, GIF is just an animated thing. You can go online and you can find GIFs. If you are fluent in Photoshop, it's easy to make GIFs in Photoshop out of just about anything. Um, this is just a little uh, animation that we did in a movie uh, a file and saved it as a, I believe this one is an MPEG. And, uh, you know, the videos are great. You can do whatever you want to a text in a video. You know, you can't do it in a static image, but you can do it in a text image. And so the idea on this, if you go back to that, I'm not going to play it again, but you might have noticed, whenever I first started that play, this image stayed up there for a pretty long time, okay? It's not a natural thing. If you just watch just this image by itself, but I'm going to tell you that's on purpose, and I'll tell you why. Remember that progression I talked about. Facebook's determined. People look at the image, they read the headline, and then they start reading the text. The ideal situation is if this image is static <coughs> until they read the text or start reading the text, and then start moving because then it draws their eye back to that and it draws their interest to it, okay? You don't want someone, you've got a very, very, very limited amount of time before somebody takes their thumb and scrolls up past your ad on Facebook. So you've got to come up with some way to capture their attention, to make sure they read the content of what you've got, to give their mind a chance to even assimilate that information and make a decision on is this something I'm interested in learning more about or not. Okay, so in that amount of time, you've got to do something that kind of captures them and keeps them right on your ad. So that's, that's what we do with our, our videos a lot of times, we do something like that right there. Now we get to talk about where are we going to send them, okay? I mentioned we've got the URL, craftbeergolf.com. You just put it in right there. Now that's where there's a little button on here. We'll show down here. That actually, you can select what that button says on Facebook, okay? Uh, this is the URL that will send someone to when they push that button. Okay, uh, the display link is a different thing. Oops, different thing from the website URL. Okay, even though we've got the same one right here, you don't have to put this in. This is actually what shows on the ad. This does not show on the ad. This is where the button, the call to action button, sends someone who clicks on that button. Then down here we also have the text. Remember, I showed that text that was over top of the uh, uh, the picture there. And then you also have what's called the news feed link description, okay? So this actually goes underneath the headline. This is the headline, and news feed link description goes underneath that. This, a lot of, there's a lot of attention paid to what this one right here says in different formats. If you're looking at this on, let's say, an iPhone versus your desktop, or even an iPad, there are different versions of this ad that will display. In some instances, the news feed link description doesn't even show up. All it shows is just your headline, okay? So you need to kind of learn a little bit about that and be careful, you know, how do you put your wording, where do you put your wording, because in some instances, if you're putting all of your wording in the news feed link description, it may not even show up, okay? And then finally, you select what is your uh, call to action. This is not a live uh, thing on the, the Facebook, but if you click on that drop down right there, there's a whole bunch of different options they have. Learn more, book now, you know, all different kind of things like that. You try to pick one that's relevant to what you're trying to get them to do. We say book now, and when they click on that, it, bam, it sends them to our website. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about the results of this one right here. I mentioned we ran this for five days. Okay, uh, and our reach on those five days, we reached 11,415 people. We got 196 link clicks. My average cost per click, in other words, for each one of those 196 clicks, I paid 87 cents. So my total spend on this campaign was $169.79. Okay, now our average on this is $100 per player. Remember, I mentioned we're selling this in increments of $400. So, um, you know, that's a pretty good return right there. Get 196 clicks click through to something we're trying to sell at $400 a pop. That's a pretty good return on the investment. So the results of this tournament, well, by the way, I want to mention something about this right here. This tournament sells out now. Um, this year, three weeks before the tournament, we had a waiting list of eight teams. It never, we never did, we didn't have a single cancellation. You know, so none of those eight that were on the waiting list got to go back on. All of them are saying, we want to be on the list that you send it to first next year. You know, so this is a great term. We make a lot of money with it. Uh, and again, something that's just a natural for golf, I think. I think it's something, if you're not doing this, I would highly encourage you if you don't do anything else. You don't even have to use the sales phone. Do a craft beer golf term. A lot of, a lot of upside for that. Okay, we'll shift gears. I'm going to go to a little different type of sales phone. All right? This is one that we did for a program. And this was a learn-to-play golf program. All right, I know we've got some, a lot of PGA professionals 
in the room here, but uh, thanks to a lot of the efforts and everything from the PGA, we actually had a partnership with KPMG the accounting firm. And they were working with us to try to get their staff members at all of their locations to play golf. Okay? And this is something we work uh, real closely with the PTA on the Getting Off Ready. Y'all probably familiar with Getting Off Ready. It's a learn to play program that we do. And so we developed, in conjunction with the local KPMG office, a customized Get Off Ready package for them. All right? And now when I mean customized, I mean really customized. Okay? Because even this logo, I told you I'm a big believer in logos. This is the Get Golf Ready logo. This is the KPMG logo, okay? Get Golf Ready, this is actually a really kind of bright blue on their logo. Don't tell the PGA this, but I changed the color, okay? <laughs> I customized it because I wanted this to look real good. So we just stole their purple color, we put it in there, and replaced the blue with it because the purple, green, and blue did not match, okay? So we, we actually rebranded this, and we made this very customized to them. So our objective in this particular program was to drive online signage. Back to the whole thing. I don't want to call it up on the phone and say, what is this I'm looking at? We might come out and play and tell me something about it, you know? My staff just really doesn't have time. They would love to do it, but they don't have time to answer this kind of phone call. So we kind of drive them online. We set the maximum number of 10 for the registrants for this event. Uh, our target market were employees of the KPMG Charlotte location. Our collection method on this was different than the other one. We actually used a WordPress website, okay, and a plugin that's called Timely Ticketing. And if you're familiar with, web, with WordPress websites, there are a gazillion plugins. Plugins are little things that you can add to your WordPress website to do virtually anything that you want to do. There are a number of event type uh, um, solutions for WordPress websites. This one actually works real good because it actually allows you to do the collections online and the money comes to you through your PayPal account. So again, we always try to get the money up front. Everything that I do, I like having people pay for it at the time they register. We don't wait till they come in the door, we get the money up front. So we use this WordPress website for the time of ticketing plugin. Our awareness on this, okay, this OPL email. If I want to take a guess, what, what does OPL stand for? It's one of my favorite things to use. Other people's list. Other people's list, exactly right. Other people's list. Anytime you can use other people's list to market your event, you can do it. You know, these are fresh, these are fresh leads for you. These are people you want to get in your phone. Okay, the other one was just internal distribution within the KPMG office. Okay, so coming back to that, the first thing we needed to do was to design the collector. We already know our target market, we already know how we're going to be reaching them, so we needed to design this collector tool. So this is WordPress website. Anybody here familiar with how you edit WordPress? Okay, fairly simple. It, well, I'll take that back. There's a learning curve to it, but once you learn the learning curve, editing a WordPress website is not difficult at all, okay? This is one that I set up, and I literally spent maybe 30 minutes setting this up for this particular sales phone. Now, one of the things I did, I mentioned I'm a big believer in unique URLs. I like URLs that are easy for people to remember. Unfortunately, on this one, I didn't use one that was easy for people to remember. The reason was the bulk and majority of distribution of this one goes out through emails to the staff at KPMG. So they're just literally able to click on that link. They don't really have to remember what that website is to be able to type it in later. The website that I bought for this one was KPMG GDR. Okay? KPMG GDR. Now the other good thing about it is we didn't want the whole world. This is not something we wanted to open up to the whole world. We wanted it to be specific to KPMG. So the odds of somebody finding this through a web search are extremely low. You know, so that was one good thing about having a pretty difficult uh, uh, URL to learn. So when you come into where, uh, WordPress, there, and, and you know, we could spend literally days on setting up WordPress websites, but I'm just gonna tell you real quick what we do. You use a theme in WordPress. A theme is a predetermined arrangement or a layout of what your website is gonna work, look like. All right, from there you have a huge amount of flexibility. You can change your themes. You can change the color of your thing. You can change the font on your thing. You can add pages to your thing. You can add all of these different plugins to your thing, okay? So you can take a WordPress website, you can customize about however much you want to. But for us, we wanted to keep it very simple. I just wanted something quick and easy that we could drive the KPMG staff to so that they could come to our website and they could sign up for this uh, particular thing. So it's a very simple web website. If you look right here, I'm actually on the pages menu. 
there are only four pages on this website. I've got home, I've got a page about getting off ready, I've got contact us, and I've got the classes. And that's all we have on this website, okay? Uh, we don't want to send them a whole, whole lot of different places looking at a lot of different things. But there was a strategy to this, and I want to show you. Okay, this uh, this is the plugin that we've got right here. If you look right over here, you see we've got a list of plugins. Now I'm on the plugin menu within WordPress. This all-in-one event calendar by Timely, that's the one that we use to, uh, to actually schedule these and collect the money for uh, the event. Now, again, after 30 minutes, this is what the website looked like. You know, it's very, very plain, simple, but it gets the job done. It is great to have a beautiful website. I am all for beautiful website design. But what I am more about is a website that produces results. You know, we want people to get in, see it, make the decision, pay us their money, and go on to doing whatever else they want to do, okay? So, this one's very simple. Our proposition that we are providing to these people was phenomenal. I'm a big believer also, if you can make that irresistible offer, you're going to drive conversion. So for this one, we actually had our price at $125. They get five easy lessons. If you're the first 10 sign-ups, and that's the one where you accept 10 sign-ups, you also get a $50 gift card that you can redeem in our golf course for free golf. Because what is the one thing that we really want people to do after they take beginner golf lessons? Play golf, right? Okay? So we want to make sure that as they're learning the game, they get out there, there's no hurdles, there's no impediments to them getting out on the golf course and playing golf. Now another thing that we did with this website, and I'm going to talk about this later on in the presentation, a good funnel, a good collective page, a good landing page, doesn't have a lot of different choices for what you can do and where you send the person that goes to that page. This one was a little bit different. Now remember, everybody at KPMG was getting directly to this website. KPMG actually has a lot of people that already play golf, okay? They may not be interested in a learn to play golf program, but maybe they're interested in, I can say, already play golf, okay? On this particular one, and this, what this is, if you look at the previous, that's the top page. If you scroll down, if you would hit the scroll bar and scroll down, this is the very next thing you see, that big banner picture right above this. So under our three choices we've got right underneath that banner picture, we've got what is getting golf ready, because honestly that is not a term that resonates well with the public out there, so we kind of have to explain what the heck is get golf ready mean. You know, that doesn't translate into learn to play golf very well. Um, and then we've got already play golf. If you're already a golfer, right the golf services have got something for you. They click right here on learn more. It actually takes you to our website, charlottepublicgolf.com. And then some people we have found do not like taking scripture lessons. Okay? They just don't like to do that. We're, a lot of guys don't like to do that. We don't like to stop and ask for directions someplace. And one of the greatest things that ever happened is they got Google Maps on our phone. So now when we get lost, we can go to Google Maps and find out where we're going without having to ask somebody. Okay? So when we learn to play golf, a lot of times, a very common response that we get is, well, you know, I just want to learn enough where I can get a little bit better and then I'll come take lessons. You know? They want to get over that initial learning curve. They want to get by the embarrassment. All right, so we've got a whole series of what we call learning courses. Every one of our golf courses has a short course at it that's anywhere from three to nine holes that they can come and they can play, and they don't cost a lot of money. Average cost is six bucks for them to play around on those. They don't even have to have equipment. We'll give them equipment to play. They don't have to have lessons. The average length of the hole is less than 100 yards. So they can come out and they can play, and as their skill sets get to the point where they feel comfortable, then they can start moving on up the ladder, they can come take lessons if they want, or something like that. And then down at the very bottom of the page, we've got a little blurb here for somebody that doesn't know anything. We're showing how much fun golf is having. I'm not sure if that guy's having fun or if he's in pain, but everybody else seems to have a good time that he is. So we're showing that to everybody, what a great sport this is. And then we're telling them this offer is limited. It's 100% money back guarantee, too, by the way. Somebody comes and takes our Get Golf Ready program, but they're not happy, we give them all the money back. And in this instance, we told KPMG, we'll give you the $50, keep the $50 card. If you come out and you play and you don't like it, we'll give your money back plus the $50 card is yours. So what was the result of this campaign that we did right here, okay? We didn't spend a dime on marketing, by the way. We just got KPMG to use their list, and they sent that list out. We ended up having 12 participants. I lied. We didn't stop it at 10. We ended up having 12 participants that came out, okay? Each one paid $125, so we had $1,500 gross revenue. I split that with my instructor, by the way. It's one of the most common questions I get. Who gets the money, okay? We split that with the instructor, all right? In a lot of instances, I give you more of that to the instructor because my guys are great. They, they treat these people well. We get repeat business from them. 
And then the other question is, well, what about residual? Okay, we did okay right here. The facility got 750. My instructor got 750. Out of those 12 participants, we had zero refunds. We did not have a single person who came back and said, I want the money back. You know, so we got to keep all of the $1,500. What's more than that? We got four of them that are highly active. They're out of our course at least twice a week now. They're getting golf balls and driving rings. They're playing on golf courses. They're even playing on these little learning courses that we've got. And the interesting side effect to this one particular one, we ran this event in May, by the way. And by the way, these four are still playing right now. Right before I came out here, I checked on teaching. They're still playing with us, okay? A team from KPMG entered the can open. All right? I still haven't really figured out exactly how that happened, but it happened, okay? And this was a team of golfers that already played. Somehow they found out about the can open through our marketing, and they, they came to us and came to us from this website. I think what happened was they went to this one. They clicked on the ones, you know, they already play golf. They went to Charlotte Public Golf. We were marketing. We had a banner on there for the, uh, the uh, can open, and I think that's how they, they got in. Okay, so two examples, very different examples of how these sales funnels are built, but it shows you the different uh, ways you can construct a sales funnel. Now, an ideal sales funnel, like I mentioned before, you really kind of want to constrict that pipeline, okay? Both of the examples I showed you aren't quite the ideal sales funnel of what we typically see on an internet promotion. But we have actually seen an example of one. Who, who downloaded, has anybody downloaded the worksheet in here? Anybody go on time download the worksheet? Well, if you did, you actually saw something that was a sales funnel. We'll get to that back in a minute. I forgot about this one side. I do want to mention this. I always like to talk about growing golfers, okay? Growing golfers is one of the things that we all in the golf business should be dedicated to doing. You know, it's our lifeline. It is the future of our business. We really need to be making investments in growing golfers. I've actually shown some of the results of what we did with KPMG uh, to somebody. They said, well, you know, you did all that work and you've only got four golfers out of that. Well, guess what? Golfers are created one at a time. Anyway, I don't know anybody can wave a magic wand and create 100 golfers at a time. But we made money while we created those four golfers. We're making money while those four golfers are continuing to play with us. And it's scalable too. Just think, now we've actually done this. We've gone to other entities. Jacobson was a manufacturer right there in Charlotte. They just recently consolidated with Easy and moved down to Augusta. But while they were there, we went to Jacobson and we said, hey, you guys need to start getting golf ready to Jacobson. We worked with them. We had over 80 employees at Jacobson that learned to play golf through a get golf ready type program. We've done the same thing with Pepsi. We've actually had a get golf ready program with Pepsi. Big supplier with us there at our local Pepsi distributor in Charlotte. So you can do this, but you have to realize it still happens at that one golfer at a time scale. And in order to be successful, there's a couple of real keys that we don't often talk about. I want to make sure I get this. Anytime I've got a group of golf operators, I want to be talking about this. Because one of the first things that you really need to do is to be able to automate your marketing. As much as possible, you want your marketing to do your work for you. If you're depending on your frontline staff to sell whatever it is that you're marketing, and especially in terms of learn to play, to your existing customer base, I can tell you that that's all wrong. Number one, the golfers that are coming very rarely are really interested in learn to play programs. They're already playing golf, okay? Your only hope is that they have someone that they know or a member of their family or something that they would get into it. The other thing is, is you're taking away valuable resource time from your staff members to communicate this marketing message that you could probably do a much better <coughs> job to a much more receptive market if you can automate your marketing. The other thing is replicate your successes. Everything that we do is not successful. I will be the first one to tell you that. We do a lot of things that fizzle, okay? But when we have something that works, we replicate it. We make sure that we can take the things that we use and reuse those things. We can reuse the WordPress website. We can reuse the Golf Digest Planner. We can reuse our emails. You know, we repurpose emails all the time. And then the other thing is leverage your resources. This is one of the number one things that we need to do a better job in golf. And by leverage your resources, I mean we need to get more people helping us create golfers. The majority of golfers that were created that play golf today learn the game through a fan, friend, a family member, or business associate. Okay? Our best marketing tool are existing customers. Even though selling them on the Learn to Play program is not the way to go, I am a firm believer that getting them to invite somebody out and play with them is. We actually have structured a, a, a very um, successful program within our marketing where we actually kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say we pay them off, but we give incentives to golfers to bring non-golfers out to the golf course and play on our learning courses and get them introduced into the game. 
Okay, so I want to talk about a, a better sales funnel, a better landing page. This is a landing page. If you went to that info.delracta.com, this is what you landed on. This has a couple of really good things on it that I want to point out to you. First and foremost, you'll notice there is no menu bar up here. There's no way for you to go. Once you're on this page, you have two ways that you can get out of this page without filling out the form. You can X out, and you can close the browser altogether, or you can hit the back button right here on the browser. Other than that, there's no way to get off the page. You're forced into filling out this form and then clicking, yes, please send me the email, uh, our, the RGS sales from the worksheet to me. Now, in a lot of instances, people will still bounce off of this page. They won't fill this form out. But because we're not putting anything on this page that distracts them, this is what's known as a squeeze page in terms of landing pages. It kind of squeezes them into an action. So if you can design your landing pages so that you can kind of control what their options are, this is always a better thing. Okay, so we've gone through three types now. You experienced the sales funnel right there that you probably didn't even realize you were experiencing when I gave you that website. Any questions? Anybody have any questions, any comments, anything you uh, didn't cover that you want to talk about? I learned everything. <laughs> we know I'll take a <laughs> All right, do we have any, 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 anybody want to talk about some of the stuff that they've done? And we have some good examples of uh, sales funnel or marketing efforts that you found really successful that you'd like to share. I think that's one of the things we always end up doing really successful at these events is learning from everybody else. Yes, sir. Good. Wait, one of our uh, two clubs actually in the Netherlands, what they did, they did, I like to take you G thing you show, what they did, they went to the local professional football club, soccer club, mm -hmm. and they went to their business club, and they created a special, uh, like Ajax is a big football club in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. the Ajax educate, learn to play golf. And the Ajax wanted that because they want their, their business club people to connect more with each other right. outside the football stadium as well, and it worked really good. And the golf course got to get new golfers from that from that experience. So the KPMG thing you can also do with sports clubs and other business clubs. That's phenomenal. That's a great idea. Yeah, you know, almost any any kind of a you know, organization that has people that they want to have any kind of team going or anything, it's a great opportunity yeah. for something like that. Well, I saw another hand back there too. Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, that kind of piggybacks um, to a friend um, right outside of DC, Northern Virginia. We have a slew of associations and different businesses, and um, we work closely with a lot of the chambers of commerce. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, they do fundraisers and team building and all those sorts of things. Um, but also, um, just remarketing to people who've taken the get call for any one, and then kind of moving to two, and then three, and it's kind of the same thing you were saying, like getting them on the course. And, Mm -hmm. We're in the process of coming up with kids packages for them to incentivize them that's to come awesome. play. That is great. And that's one of the big downfalls I think we continue to see with Kick Golf Radio is we, we host the first sessions and this is industry wide. We don't do a really good job of following up you know, once they've taken that first session and making it's, sure that they continue to play golf. It's a little challenging because our currently our um, where you sign up for a class it doesn't talk to our email database, so it's kind of Definitely uh, getting those names, dumping them over, and then just. Now, how do you handle know, it? Who, in your course, who's responsible for that task? Who takes those emails and kind of aggregates your email? Uh, well, I, I'm a golf marketing specialist, okay. so I'm not actually an operator, so okay. everything marketing comes my Comes to you. Okay. Very broad term marketing. Right. So. That's, that's what, you know, it is one of the challenges, particularly for single course operators. You know, somebody's wearing the hat uh, of all the functions there. You know, do you have time to do tasks like that? You know, and it, 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 a lot of times it's difficult to implement that. You, you really need to process it in place. That's why I say you can automate it. In any way that you can automate that. We, we've actually spent a lot of money developing automation means of, of ways that we automate things, you know, because uh, it's actually worth it. Because I look at that as an investment that replaces labor, you know, that, and particularly if it's something that drives revenue. You, you, it's easy to justify something like that. Yes? Less of a comment, but more of a question. I was curious if anybody in the group uses remarketing in the fact that you know, click on the piano one day, the next day it shows up on the Good question. Does anybody use remarketing in the marketing efforts? Good one here. Yes, that's Mark. I'm sure you guys do. You know, remarketing is a great tool. And we use it, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it, and you can see, you can see remarketing, uh, you know, anytime you do a search for something and then three days later all of a sudden the item magically pops up on your, you know, your, your, your phone, 
uh, hey, where, who, who's watching what I'm doing? Like, that's free marketing out there. How about, how about uh, yes, sir? Hey, no, I was free marketing wise. What we've had a lot of success with is connecting our email and our social media campaigns. So through our email tool, what we can do is, we can, let's say we do an email blast to a specific list that we know is interested in these types of events. We can then remarket to fit with Facebook ads and people who open that email. It's going to get better results. And coming back to automation, you know, the tools that are available for us now in emails and um, literally automated uh, marketing tools that are available, it's amazing how much you can design based on what the actions are of that particular individual, whether they've opened an email. You can actually design now, uh, we've got an automated platform that we can design what we call dynamic content. So in other words, based on a certain criteria of what that individual that receives that email might get, they actually get different messages in the email that are more custom tailored to that particular recipient. You know, whether they've clicked on it, whether they've ever clicked on it. If you sent the same email to them multiple times, they haven't clicked on it. They may get a different email. You know? So there's, there's a lot of things that you can do with that. And a lot of the tools are becoming more and more sophisticated. You know, I mentioned MailChimp. MailChimp has gotten really good in terms of the automated tools that they did they in out there. Do that. Um, form building, you know, having different ways of using forms and surveys and things like that. Does anybody do something like that? And this this last one that I did right here, you know, I was really doing that kind of tongue in cheek to show you what a really good sales funnel can be. Does anybody have any kind of automated offer where somebody gives you their email and they get an automatic free download of a PDF, they get a learn playbook or something? Okay, here we go. How, how does that work for you? Yeah, and that's you know again. There's, once you've designed it and you've got that in place, it's doing all the work for you. You know, those emails are coming in and you're automatically collecting those emails. You're sending them whatever that piece of information may be, which a lot of times you're having to give something to get something. You know, they got to see value in that in order to give up their email address and download whatever that might be. But there are a lot of people out there, you know, that are, are looking for what we have to offer. It can be anything from tournaments and outings. You know, you should have some form of an automated um, collection system for tournament directors. You know, if somebody's wanted to host a tournament at your facility, you want to be able to capture their name and information and hopefully some information on what that event is so that you can market to them. They may not choose to pick up the phone and call you or even shoot you an email and ask you questions. So you want to be able to make sure that you've got some way that you can start emailing to them. You can design forms that not only Download a PDF. Let's say it's how to host a successful golf tournament. Sign up right here and get our five tips for hosting a successful golf tournament. Okay? Any golf uh, director of a golf tournament is going to want to say, hey, I'll put an email down for that. You can then design a, trip, a drip email campaign that will on a regular basis send emails out to that particular person talking about what your course or your club or your facilities offer in the way of a tournament, an hour, an event. How about geofencing? Who's using geofencing? Okay, we've got two of them using geofencing. Does everybody know what geofencing is? It's scary. I'm telling you, that's what it is. Your phone knows everything about you. It knows everywhere you go. You know, so we geofence and we target our competitor courses. If you go play golf at a competitor golf course, you're going to get an ad from me. Okay, it is equivalent, in my opinion, to being able to stand in their parking lot and hand everybody that drives out of that driveway a brochure. Okay? And they will continue to see your ads. It's actually a form of remarketing. They will continue to, can continue to see your ads. Another scary thing about it is we can track what the results are. If you go play one of my competitor <coughs> golf courses, you see that ad, you click on my ad, and then you come to one of my golf courses, I get a report, and I know that I got a conversion on that. Okay? Yes, sir. Where, where are you in Geo Target? What school are you using? Yeah. Is we you actually, we're, we're actually uh, combining with a, a local uh, company that does that. They actually do that. Now, I've got a couple of, of tech companies that we, we partner with. You can do geofencing on your own, but it's, it's, it's pretty time intensive, you know, and we found it's, it's better to get somebody that does it all the time, but it's how to do it. What are you saying, hey, let's play my golf course? They're banner ads. What happens is when, when uh, and here's what the technology is. For those who are not familiar, I'll run through it real quick, okay? Your phone has location services on it, okay? It knows through GPS where you go. If you've got your phone on and you have GPS uh, or location services enabled, which most of, most of us do, if you're using Google Maps or you're using some kind of thing to tell you how to get places, location services are enabled on your phone. 
And your phone knows you're sitting in the RA right now. Okay, it knows you're here. So we can actually draw with geofencing, you can draw a perimeter around where your phone is, and that perimeter can be as tight as 100 meters, 300 yards. And in some instances, it's actually be tighter than that. Okay, so you can target just about any place, and when your phone goes into that area that you've targeted, okay, you break that barrier, that fence, and the, the, uh, the network will then start delivering ads anytime that phone goes to a browser, okay? If it goes through Google AdWords, you know, if you, any, any website that, that gets paid advertising, they've got Google AdWords enabled, they've seen them on, it's the same thing with retargeting. Same place retargeting ads show up, your banner ads will show up. Now, banner ads, another great thing about banner ads, you can do the same thing. You can do a static image on banner ads. I highly advise that you do a GIF. You don't want to do video for banner ads, but you can do a GIF because it's animated, flashes, you know, get people's attention, so somebody dancing, doing something to grab their attention when it shows that banner on there, okay? And that's a great way to get people that you know they're golfers if they're playing with your competitors. You know, the, I'll tell you, the, the, uh, the possibilities with that are, are just limitless. It's mind boggling of course, you can do with something like that. Now, your conversion on that, that is an impression based. You can't do pay per click right now on geofencing. That's an impression based, so you really have to kind of monitor it, um, you know, and say, okay, here I'm paying for. You know, usually you're buying an increments of a minimum of 10,000 impressions. You know, we generally buy about hundreds of thousands, and we we'll want to of hundreds of thousands. When the, when the PGA Championship was in Charlotte, we targeted Quail Hollow. Now, everybody went to Quail Hollow on our parking list. The problem with that is it ate up a lot of our impressions. You know, <coughs> once you use up your impressions, excuse me, then it starts to it stops delivering those ads. You know, nobody sees those ads anymore because you used up all your impressions for whatever that time period is. But it's still a great tool for you to get to. Uh, somebody like that. Um, something else I wanted to mention on this too, and I don't know if anybody is um, really using this or not. You know, when you when you think about all the opportunities out there, Google AdWords is another. One. You know, um, is everybody using AdWords? Do you have many people using AdWords? Okay, AdWords can be expensive. All right, it, it, it really you know it's, it's a bidding system. It's a pay per click. Uh, you, know, you really have to watch what your conversion rates are, what your cost per click are. That's largely determined by algorithms, and I have no idea how to figure. Uh, all right, and sometimes it can be economical, and sometimes it can't be. I have never seen the pay per click rates on Google AdWords that I can get on Facebook or social media. That's why I like Facebook. You know, I can target. You can target. Uh, you know, the great thing about Google is you know, you know, you're responding to certain search terms. Best deals on golf. You know. Uh, greatest golf course in Charlotte. You know, you can target what the phrases are that people are actually searching for to show your ad to. So you know they already are actually kind of a pre-qualified prospect before you show that ad to them. All right, but if your ad doesn't convert, Google AdWords actually starts penalizing you and you start paying more for the clicks. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of a complicated algorithm. Yes, sir. Jim. Do you um, allocate a percentage of your red, uh, revenue to the advertising like percent in gross or something like that. That's, that's the number we use. We use three percent. It's a line item budget. We have it. It's actually plugged into our spreadsheet. You know, it's three percent of the gross is what we use. And you know, I'll tell you, that's it's really evolved. Uh, 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 another one is. Um, uh, does anybody ever heard of CallRail or any of the, the call tracking services? Um, you know, the, the reality is we we try to drive people online. You know, that's what we really like for them to. Consumer information and purchase whatever they, they purchase from us online because that way we don't have, to have somebody there. The majority of our customers still they want to call up on the phone, they want to talk to somebody at the golf course. All right, that's great and that's fine. We certainly still handle that. But how do you know where did that person get your phone number from? All right, there are services out there that you can use. Call Rail is one of them that we use. We do a print campaign, for example. Okay, we do a print campaign and we run it in a particular publication. CallRail will give us a phone number. It's a unique phone number that's not in use anywhere else. All right, and we put that phone number. We don't put our regular phone number for the facility in there. We put that phone number. Somebody dials that phone number, it goes through their server, and then it transfers it to our number. It's completely seamless to the person making the call. Okay, but then we know where that call came from because only people that saw that ad get that number. Okay? <clears throat> So that's a very targeted way that you can actually track some of your campaigns that you do through print or other means that don't have people to click on it. 
Now, one of the real interesting things about that is you can also, those, those calls typically are recorded. So you can see if you ever call a number that says your call may be recorded for quality assurance purposes, 99% of the time that company is using the number you call is probably not their main number that they have in if you're going through one of those services, okay? And we go in regularly and we look at that. And I'll tell you, it's really, it's really eye-opening to see this great staff training uh, exercise. They're going to see how does your staff really handle those calls. And I can tell you, most of the time at our facilities, the way calls are handled on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. are totally different than the way they're handled on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. You know, uh, you can tell. You can hear it in their voices. That's why we really try to drive. You know, we actually, uh, we, we work with Easy Links. Uh, Kevin was back at these gone, but you know, we use their call center extensively, you know, because I would rather have somebody sitting in the call center dealing with that customer, giving them the attention to the personal thing than my guy at the counter who's feeling under pressure because he's got eight golfers in front of him who are anxious to get out there on the first team. He's trying to handle the phone and, and sell golf balls and do everything else and be nice to the customers all at the same time as well. Some great, great conversations here. Anybody have any other things? Yes, ma'am. On your point, your first slide, you talked about the importance of um, the majority of our spend now is going towards social media. It really is. Okay, we do print uh, some. All right, we will do certain print publications, particularly ones that are targeted to the golf market. We've got and most most areas have these little, you know, golf in Charlotte magazines or Mecklenburg Golf or something like that. So we'll do we do some print marketing with them. Um, we do a um, uh, occasionally we'll do buys on. Now that's, that's actually not a bad spend for you. Again, if you design it into a sales funnel, television advertising, everybody thinks television advertising is expensive, and it can be, it certainly can be. You know, I got a call, when the championship was in, I got a call from one of the outlying uh, uh, stations, and they wanted to sell us advertising uh, during the championship. And so I just out of curiosity, I said, well, how much is it? And they said, well, our first package starts at $30,000. I said, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, you know, cable ad, I used to do a cable TV show. We used to produce a TV show in Charlotte, okay? And just to give you an idea, if you work with cable providers, <coughs> cable providers in your area, it's amazing what kind of rates you can get. I bought what's called long form, all right? We got 28 and a half minutes, and we got Friday evenings at 6 o'clock. Guess, guess how much I paid for 30 minutes of television time on a Friday evening at 6 o'clock in a major metro market like Charlotte. So I want to guess how much money that cost me? $365 each week, all right? I paid $365 each week for 30 minutes of time. Now, the bad thing about it was is I had to come up with content for 30 minutes, you know? And that killed me. You know, we, we did, I did it for almost six years. Um, you know, we were right doing television. We were interviewing people, you know, we were shooting on the golf course. We had, we would sit around the and say, what are we going to do for the show this week? And we said, let's go out and play golf. So we would go out there, we'd get a whole bunch of guys, we'd go out and play golf, we'd have a ball, we'd edit it down, we'd make a TV show out of it, and just show everybody how we were having such a good time out playing golf. But it was uh, the editing portion, the shooting that, you got to have the camera guys, you got to have the sound people, you got to have somebody to edit it, it gets to be pretty expensive. But you can produce a 30 minute course, you know, nowadays, honest to goodness, the quality on your cell phone is good enough to produce broadcast quality images. You can actually shoot a TV commercial on your cell phone today. Now, would you want to do that? Maybe not. You, know, you may want a little professional uh, quality on that, but you, know, you can spend the money on production of that. And uh, you know, generally, when we're doing cable ad net buys, we're not paying but somewhere around two two dollars a spot, two to no more than four dollars a spot. Now, we have to buy what's called rotators and something like that, which means you just kind of get slotted in when they have some open time. You know, you can't buy. Okay, I want an ad to run during the. PJ Championship, for example, you know, your ads, now they will give you some in prime time, you know, but your ads might be running at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, we actually cut a deal with them at one point when I was doing a TV show where we ran um, at 2 a.m. on Wednesday night. It was really technically Thursday morning, okay? We actually had more people that saw the show at 2 a.m. on Thursday than they did on the Friday night. I was thinking, what are these people doing? You know, the people laying in bed watching TV, flipping to the channels, and they didn't see it. You know, I'd have people come up to me all the time and say, hey, I saw you on TV the other night. I said, oh, what are you doing Friday night? No, this was, you know, this time I was laying in bed. I saw you on TV. So it was kind of an interesting thing. You need to have ways that you can track the market. That's obviously one of the great things about technology and the internet. You know, if I mentioned services like call rate. You know, if you can use the service 
you know, all the different ways that you, you, can, you can have to collect and track the money that you're spending out there is very important. Any other questions, comments? No? All right. Well, thank you all very much. You've been great. Uh, I'm going to be around up here for a while. If you have any questions, I'm going to try out the funnel. It's up here.